Sorry, I don't hear very well. Rio plus twenty. Is that if if you, if you're not following, uh, just just let me know. We can go back. So the first Earth Summit of 1992 was in Rio de Janeiro. So then the 20-year review of of the Rio conference was called Rio Plus 20. Yeah. So it's it's the name of the city. Um, I'd like to. What kind of areas do you study exactly? There are people from uh, public affairs. Uh, I'm in the business school. Mm -hmm. Pretty wide. You're what? Computer science. Computer science. Oh wow, this is a very diverse group. Uh, media. Exactly. That's the idea. Why we're here. We're trying to make them. We are from the NGO group. We're trying to make them get uh, some more taste mm -hmm. and interest in the subject that it's not very really discussed. So coming up with your people who chase to get more appetite to understand what is really at their best interest in their own children's and children. So that's the idea of the unculturated and a bit more on the subject. Yes, yes. How many of you are from Korea? I'm just curious. No, I don't. <laughs> oh, I thought you said that you were Korean, Japanese? No, yeah. mostly Chinese. Oh, okay, okay. French, Italian, Chinese, uh, German. I see. Okay. <laughs> but mostly Chinese. Um, <clears throat> there is obviously a global political process about development that happens in, in the UN. It's convened under the UN. Um, but there has been a recognition for a very long time that achieving sustainable development is actually uh, a, mul a multi-stakeholder endeavor. Do you understand this, the concept of that? It, it means that there are many, many sectors of society that need to be involved in achieving this, because sustainable development is not a thing. It is a philosophy for how society should improve itself in a way that uh, achieves the eradication of poverty, um, and in a way that respects the natural limitations of the planet. In many ways, the planet is, I mean, in all ways, it's a finite biosphere, correct? <coughs> so, in some ways, there are limitations that we can surpass. There's other limitations that we haven't surpassed yet. But in general, we cannot surpass all of the limitations of the planetary boundaries. Um, this is a very interesting concept. It's been largely identified that there are nine planetary boundaries. Um, there are things like climate change, um, biodiversity, um, land degradation, desertification. These are things that would seriously harm the future of the planet to be able to continue growing or developing or even sustaining life. Um, it's also largely recognized that in some of these areas we have already crossed planetary boundaries, particularly in the area of, um, of, uh, of nitrogen degeneration of the soil, uh, climate change, we've already, I think it's accepted that we have already passed a limit at which we can no longer bring down the temperature of the earth. We've already passed the critical turning point. So there are certain areas like this. So one of the most important concepts of uh, sustainable development is finding a way to undertake human activity that respects these, pl these planetary boundaries. That means that policymakers need to adjust laws and policies that affect society but also the private sector needs to undertake certain responsibilities. Um, consumers and citizens need to change their behavior. Um, one of the, uh, the larger contexts of all of this discussion on sustainable development is this uh, point of time that we're at right now in 2013, which is almost the very end of the Millennium Development Goals project. Is any, are you familiar with the Millennium Development Goals? Mm -hmm. Anybody? No? In 2000, at the Millennium Summit in, in the headquarters of New York, that was considered to be one of the largest gatherings of heads of state in the world, actually, at the Millennium. There was um, a recognition that all of human development should come together under a single common agenda, and that we should start to streamline our efforts to achieve certain goals by the year 2015. And so this project, the Millennium Development Goals, was adopted, and they are eight targets for development that they, uh, they give governments 
a sense for what to achieve by what date. So in many ways, the Millennium Development Goals were very useful for the last 13 years because um, eight goals is a very elegant way of explaining what the world needs to do. It's very easy to communicate this to the general public. And it's also very useful for governments and policymakers because targets are attached to these goals. For instance, um, to uh, double the number of people in the world who are receiving uh, HIV treatment by 2015. This was one of the Millennium Development Goals. Or another one was to eradicate global poverty by half, to cut global poverty in half by 2015. Okay, so these were things that the public could engage with, that people could generally understand. The Millennium Development Goals are now coming to a close. And this is a time when governments are looking at what will come after the Millennium Development Goals and what will the human development agenda be. Rio Plus 20 was this massive conference on sustainable development in 2012. So it's clear that sustainable development is going to represent the backbone of the human development agenda for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. But we don't know how, and we don't know in what capacity governments are going to want to adopt new goals. Why is this? Because in many ways, the Millennium Development Goals were very good. They were very useful and helpful. In other ways, there were some weaknesses. They weren't so good. For instance, um, achieving the Millennium Development Goals has not been easy. Um, some goals have been achieved. Some by good policies, by sensible policies through governments and others because the global economy just grew tremendously in the 2000s. Um, in some regions, uh, the education targets were met very quickly, like in Latin America or East Asia. You have 100% enrollment in school in, those, in many of those countries. Um, in other regions, uh, like Africa, there's been very little progress in achieving MDGs, Millennium Development Goals. So these are some of the strengths and weaknesses of them. It's something that aligns all governments around achieving common purpose, but at the same time, there's a lot of regional variation. Um, progress has not been even. Um, and another critique of the Millennium Development Goals that we hear more and more in the United Nations is that um, governments feel <coughs> that that project essentially imposed con uh, a lot of requirements on poor countries to catch up and meet certain development targets to improve themselves. And it imposed very little conditions on the industrialized world, on the rich countries, okay? So this is the context of where we are today. In looking at beyond 2015, now governments are very cautious about how they're going to program this agenda and what the priorities are going to be. For instance, many countries say that there need to be equal uh, obligations for the rich and the poor. Now what does that mean exactly? Essentially, for the rich countries of the world, it means addressing the problem of unsustainable consumption <coughs> and production patterns in society. Now you can start to see the multi-dimensional uh, uh, context of sustainable development. That's going to be an issue that touches on the private sector, it touches on policy makers, it touches on people's individual behavior. Um, it also very, very much uh, calls into question the problem of income inequality in the, in the industrialized world. Now, are we going to be able to necessarily find a common agenda after 2015 that rich countries and poor countries can agree on? I don't know. The climate of the world today, the political climate, is actually very polarized. There's um, a lot of mistrust between <coughs> the developing world and the rich countries. I think it's going to be very difficult politically to ask rich countries to accept a program of requiring their citizens to cut back on their consumption and their production. Many governments are in austerity. We are also moving out of an era of uh, development aid. This is a fact. Countries are giving less that was one of the Millennium Development Goal objectives, actually, was to uh, increase the flow of foreign aid to the developing world. Some countries did it very well. Some countries surpassed their target. But most countries didn't even meet the minimum criteria uh, in the last 13 years. So it's been a bit disappointing. So one of the big questions on the agenda is what do you do about financing for development? <clears throat> All of this uh, really comes down to um, Money, yes, money is quite important and how we're going to pay for all these things. And, but another important issue is 
how um, poor countries are going to get the means to <coughs> implement sustainable development in their countries. That's usually involving the transfer of technology. And as you know, technology is under intellectual property in most rich countries. So something that we're working on in the UN in that context is um, to provide uh, options to governments for some kind of global mechanism that would facilitate the transfer of technologies that are environmentally sound from the north to the south, but also that might encourage the development of more appropriate technologies in different developing world contexts. So you see, actually, this is a very, very broad agenda. It, it, it's going to involve a lot of different parts of society working together. Are there any questions so far? <clears throat> how, how much power do you have in the UN to enact uh, those new regulations <coughs> to, the, uh, to the foreign governments? OK, that's another very good question. Um, how do these decisions taken in the UN act upon the will of governments? Well, as you know, the United Nations is a, um, it's a legally binding body. Countries that sign to the charter of the UN, they uh, are legally committed and politically committed to following the recommendations that the UN lays out. But there's really no such thing as you know, a way of enforcing international law. So if these are consensual agreements entered into by governments, which mean that um, on a lot of uh, issues where um, governments are asked to maybe make certain sacrifices or to look at things that are highly sensitive to them, whenever governments uh, are faced with looking at trade, for instance, trade is like a very, very sensitive topic for governments here. We tend to find the commitment, you know, it might start to wane. We might start to find weaker commitments, less ambitious things coming out of the UN. So are these enforceable decisions, really? No, they're not. But the fact that countries demonstrate a tremendous commitment to engaging with each other at the UN, to spending dozens of weeks a year in negotiations with each other, they send sometimes huge diplomatic missions to the UN to attend conferences and summits and to lead on certain issues. This is a sort of political will that we're looking for. And this is essentially what the UN is about. It's about trying to keep uh, an incentive for countries to stay engaged and yet also to find a space somewhere to be able to uh, criticize effectively. Um, the <coughs> UN is kind of a paradox, actually. On one hand, we, uh, we work for governments. They are our boss. They set the agenda. And on the other hand, we have a sort of um, mandate to strive for the highest common standards for the world, which means often um, you know, maybe criticizing the practices and policies of, of some of our member states. So we have to always find the right balance in order to keep advancing the agenda and at the same time make sure the countries stay invested in the process here. So far, I have to say, with sustainable development, the, um, the subscription of countries to the negotiations, to these meetings, to these processes, is absolutely overwhelming. I don't think any of us ever expected that so many countries would demonstrate such a large political investment in sustainable development. Now, <coughs> why is that? Possibly because many governments are starting to realize that this is a, an agenda that's critical for the survival of the world. You have to find ways to deal with uh, the environment. You also have to find ways to improve people's standard of living. There's too much inequality in the world. The global economy is stagnating. Maybe we need to find transitions to new forms of economy. Um, and within all of this is the role of different types of stakeholders. Now, something very unique to the sustainable development issue in the United Nations is the stakeholder environment. <coughs> when the United Nations was created in 1945, the charter of the organization um, recognizes, I think, I think it's three types of international actors in global affairs. And it recognizes sovereign governments, member states, they are actors. It recognizes regional arrangements like the European Union or the African Union or things like that, or ASEAN. It also, and those, those are political actors, and it also recognizes the role of NGOs, non-governmental organizations. So this is, this is what we, this is how we engage in the UN. Um, in, when it comes to sustainable development, though, 
it was recognized a long time ago that actually there is a multitude of different actors that have to be involved in the decision-making process. Those, that goes way beyond those three types of actors. For instance, what about the role of municipal governments, local authorities, things like that, regional planners? They are governments, yes, but they are governments at the regional level. Um, are they necessarily, they should be represented by their national delegations, their national diplomats who come and negotiate them, but they're not always. So they are welcome to join the negotiations on sustainable development. So are, for instance, um, representatives in the private sector, from business, industry. In 1945, it was not recognized that the private sector would be a very consequential actor in global affairs. And obviously today, that's a very different situation. The private sector is critical um, we don't really have a very good mechanism for how we engage the private sector in the UN because the organization's old, the charter is quite old, it doesn't really, and they basically, the private sector does not have a legal personality as an international actor. You know, so how do you involve them? And um, in sustainable development, we have this very broad mandate to bring stakeholders from lots of different types of, of communities. Um, in fact, Agenda 21 specifically says that there are nine communities in the world that need to be at the table whenever governments sit at the UN to discuss anything about sustainable development, like women, children and youth, indigenous people, trade unions have to be there, uh, you have to have representatives from farmers, um, scientists, you have to have local authorities like mayors and things like that. So it's a very broad stakeholder environment. Farmers is a very, you know, kind of weird community to have, I mean it's essential. Um, food security, production, the value chain of agricultural production. It's a, an enormous part of many, many, many countries' economies. Those of you from the European Union understand the importance of agriculture. And um, yet you have also these very, very, very uh, detached communities. You have the side of agribusiness, which has its own ideas for the agricultural industry. And you have also smallholder farmers, peasants, indigenous people, in fact, um, you know, something like 70% uh, or 80% of the world's poor are involved in food production, you know, at a very small scale. So this is a, a significant part of the world that has to be considered. So it's a very, very um, dynamic kind of environment that, that we operate in, in sustainable development. The, the subjects are highly relevant. They're very topical. They usually involve things that are at the forefront of the public's attention. Um, and yet, they have to be dealt with in a way that's um, in a, in a sense that's going to keep governments interested. Governments shouldn't feel always rejected <laughs> by uh, the UN when they come to the table to discuss these things, but rather they should feel engaged, they should feel invested, and they should feel like there's a sensible way forward. And that's something that we try to do in the UN, to provide a kind of way forward for how we're going to proceed. Did you have a question in the back? I don't understand. Uh, so this is more about application instead of implementation. Mm. What do you guys think of that? I mean, how do you see the UN? Do you see it as a place that was a lot of talking? Or do you see it as an implementer, as a leader, as a follower? I'm just curious. Yes? I feel the UN is more like setting up rules and um, right, like agendas. And then uh, and like they project it to the countries. And it's up to the countries how to uh, implement it. Mm. That's what I see. Yeah, that's good. Everyone hear that? It's like a rule setting body, an agenda setting body. Yes? Like a goalkeeper? Like a, like a goalkeeper or a scorekeeper, maybe? Mm -hmm. Someone who keeps track of the rules <coughs> of the game? Okay, that's interesting. What other impressions do you have of the UN in this type of thing? Like a supervisor? Like a supervisor, okay. So you really actually, it sounds like you see the UN as kind of um, a bit removed from what's really going on in most parts of the world. Yes. Um, so basically, UN doesn't really have the right to enforce government to, to do like what it says, to do like what it's supposed to do, right? So it doesn't really have the right to tell the government that this is what we should do. Yeah, that's a good question. The UN is basically a place for all the nations of the world to come and, and sit together. We convene opportunities for governments to meet each other. Now. Um, does the UN enforce anything? 
There are certain areas of the UN's work where, in fact, the Secretary General can take a much more proactive posture. Um, those are mostly in the area of peace and security. And the, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is in the realm of peacekeeping. Is everyone familiar with peacekeeping? Yeah. The mandates of peace? So this is, a, this is a concept that's evolved in the UN over years. It was never meant to be part of the UN's mission. It was not part of the charter. You won't find a reference to peacekeeping anywhere in the organizational framework, in the legal framework. of it. But it was a concept that evolved out of emergency and out of need. The very first peacekeeping force deployed in the 1950s to the Suez Canal. Um, at the request of permanent members of the UN. Does anyone know who the permanent members of the UN are? Mm -hmm. no. Who China, are they? Russia, China, Russia, France, France? Japan. No. no. The US. The US. And yeah, we said Russia. Britain, Great Britain. Yeah, yeah. And Germany and Japan are very consequential actors in the UN, but they are not permanent members because you have to think of the, con the context of 1945. So this is an organization, in fact, where the winners of World War II have this special status, they're permanent members, and the, does anyone know where the permanent members have a special right? Veto. They have a veto, and where is the veto? Yeah, does anyone? It's only in the Security Council, okay? So we're only talking about certain matters, certain agendas are subject to that, that, those rules of procedure. In the General Assembly, on all other matters, it's one country, one vote. So we're talking about different political dynamics. Um, that would be the only place in which you could see like the UN approaching legally binding, you know, it, for instance, <coughs> in a peacekeeping context, there are certain cases where um, we don't have to wait for countries to agree on whether a situation warrants peacekeeping. Um, there are certain cases where the Secretary General can take the decision to establish a peacekeeping mission in certain. Well, the Secretary General can recommend to the Security Council to establish a peacekeeping mission. And usually by that point, you have more or less the agreement of the Security Council of the part. So there are areas in which the UN does exercise a great deal of proactivity and, uh, in, in delivering certain mandates. And with here, we're talking about very critical types of <coughs> mandates. We're talking about humanitarian assistance, or we're talking about protection of civilians, or things like that. Um, or even in some cases, territorial integrity um, in, some, in, in some cases. But um, development is a very different type of animal, right? We're, it's not a punitive measure. We're, this is actually something that it has to be very enticing to government, so it's, it is done in consensus. It's not imposed. Um, so it's, it's, it is interesting, and you are partially right that the UN is kind of an oversight body on a lot of things. Um, maybe it's not so involved. Um, at the ground, but when it comes to development, the, the, we say the bread and butter of the UN, so that's the biggest part of its work you know, that, that we are very good at, that we do a lot of, is something called national capacity building. And that means basically advising governments technically and giving them the kind of support that's needed to build institutions and to take ownership of these different agendas at the national level because that is really, truly the only sustainable way to promote growth and development in countries if the countries themselves are doing it. So this is a, a, a club of nations that is basically meant to help countries get to know each other better, to build better relations, and to become better leaders of their people, of their society. No two countries have exactly the same form of governance, the same style, and no country is perfect in representing <coughs> the will of its citizens. But the idea is by finding common principles, you know, among all of this stuff, common agendas, um, countries can, they're free, therefore free to express themselves in a sovereign and unique way, each country. And that is kind of actually the, 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 the principle that we use in development, is it something known as common but differentiated responsibilities. Um, and that's why some of these agendas are very broad and why they leave a lot of space for countries to enact their own laws and to do things in their own terms. But, um, but anyway, that, the, the commitment to being in the UN is quite strong, even though the UN can't enforce anything. I don't think countries would want to be part of a, a, a club that would punish them occasionally, right? No one, no one would do that. So why would a country compromise its sovereignty like that? Yes. I have a very general question. I wonder, um, 
like how many sectors uh, are under like sustainable de development you've mentioned like uh, environment health and eco eco economy and are there any other sectors and what are the focuses there's on there's probably more than 40 different uh, main themes and areas that are taken under sustainable development because like I said sustainable development is not a thing let's just get this straight mm -hmm. it is a philosophy and what it essentially means is that um, is that See, development has always been treated like sectorally, like in silos. So therefore, you talk about economic development, what you're usually talking about is growth, mm -hmm. okay? You're usually talking about in, um, increasing national income, and in many ways, countries tend to do that in the most brutal possible way, whatever it takes to just raise national income. And in a way, that's because we measure national income by GDP. We don't have yet a better system, but something that we're working on in the UN actually is recommending alternative ways of measuring um, prosperity in countries. Um, when we talk about promoting social development, we're usually talking about enlarging people's freedoms. We're usually talking about improving people's quality of life, um, making people more powerful agents in their society politically to be able to make decisions, to self-determine. When you talk about the environment, you're usually talking about using less resources. Okay, so that's actually kind of diametrically opposed to the growth paradigm, isn't it? To grow, you use more resources. To conserve, you have to stop growing. So something in sustainable development is about trying to find the intersection of all of these different agendas in a way that also promotes a better quality of life for people. Because the idea is, I mean, I don't want to sound radical or anything, but you know, in the most ideal form, we should have essentially a global middle class of about 8 billion people in the next 30 years. And we should have very, very small numbers of poor people, and we should have very, very small pe numbers of extremely rich people. And this is what would, in the end, benefit society and guarantee its sustainability. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> I talk to this, and I was looking at what you just said, that you can't grow without opportunity. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm looking at some of the development that's mm -hmm. going on right now between sustainable uh, in green energy, actually, production. From uh, cars, we go to hydrogen. Like, for example, BMW is leader in that. You go to the airport in Munich, there's already a new BMW cars, so there's a producing of BMW, we call it in hydrogen, with the charger car with the solar panels in your mm -hmm. house, and you all be only taking vapor and water coming out. And then you have solar energy developing it very fast. We know in China the biggest boost from the world for that, for example, mm -hmm. of solar panels. And, uh, and you have, uh, I mean, so much, so much um, opportunities now that can make housing units, for example, so sustainable mm -hmm. between the recycling of water, solar energy, wind energy, and the hydrogen for the car. So what do you think they might be able to <coughs> make the heaven, which, especially the developing world that's more in the south and more solar power in the valley, mm -hmm. which we can grow, but also not polluting more? Yeah, it's a very, very good point, and a lot of um, a lot of enterprising people in the private sector, scientists, government leaders have started to see that there's a there's that technology could be a great solution for promoting a healthier, more sustainable world. Um, however, it's not the only solution. Why is that? Because technologies can be very expensive and they can be inappropriate in some parts of the world. Um, the other thing to bear in mind that's also raised a lot in the UN. Uh, because we have a lot of member states, is that the world's poor in many ways represent the most sustainable sector of society ever because their carbon footprint is so small and their consumption is so sustainable. And actually, Germany is a beautiful example of an efficient and uh, clean and developed country that has solar powered everything, but um, it also has a very, very, very high degree of, you know, of consumption and emissions in the world. Um, so it's something that's considered in you know in, in, in very broad context. I'm not an expert on uh, on energy, but I think it's a very it's probably going to be one of the areas that you'll hear the most about in the next few years because there's general recognition that um, achieving universal access to energy all over the world. You are talking universal access, okay? That's a big deal. Everybody in the world gets power by 2030. That's considered largely to be totally feasible now. I think most governments are going to adopt this in the next few years as a target. Yeah, we had an event in Indonesia some years yeah. ago, and they were telling us that some 50% of the households don't have electricity in the house, which is awful. So, obviously, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other area is like sanitation um, and water. Like it's also probably feasible to be able to give everyone in the world a toilet by a certain time. But water is a much more complex and, and difficult issue because um, if you wanted to talk about water from the dimension of sanitation, it, it's a human rights issue. Everyone would have right to a clean environment and drinking water. But if you want to talk about water in a more holistic way, then you start to discuss the, the usage of water and the management of water resources, and that starts to touch on the autonomy of the private sector, on the consumption of aquifers, how agriculture, so then it becomes a very, very touchy subject. But most people agree that we should all have toilets and we should be able to wash our hands and drink clean water. But what about after that? I mean, what about real sustainable management of water resources, you know? So this is where the debate is right now. I mean, this is how the, how the debate has moved along, just to give you an idea. Yes? So before globalization, like for any country, they always have two heads of two frontiers. One is about facing themselves, which is like uh, uh, the issues <coughs> within the country, and then there is an issue outside the country for some fighting that they were, they were in place. Uh, but now, for globalization, there is no counter frontier of human beings as a whole. Do you think that is the problem? Like, is, what is the vision? So, basically, I think the UN is created because of the uh, World War II, mm -hmm. and that we need to have a reform for peace forever. <coughs> so, and then there is the UN. And so, for now, so it's like we have fixed some things around. So, basically, we try to create equality across so, uh, 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 different parts of the world uh, in different areas and catch up. But it seems that we are always, always facing inside, basically, with no frontier for human beings at the moment. Mm. Is there a plan for the UN for example, to explore the planet Earth or something? <laughs> That's interesting. No, the UN's mandate is confined to planet Earth. Although there is actually a UN Office of Outer Space Affairs, UN USA, that's in um, Vienna. But it, there's actually a lot of problems in outer space. I don't know if you understand, like the space garbage and debris, and also peaceful uses of outer space. You know, many countries are starting to take uh, territory and outside of the uh, ozone layer to like uh, weaponize space. I mean, there's actually a need to to reach some agreement on outer space, but. Um, Something interesting that you point to is, is the fact that, yes, the UN was created out of World War II, and the initial intent of the organization was to prevent uh, a relapse of global war <coughs> like that. In the last 67 years of the United Nations, we have actually seen almost the total eradication of interstate war. There are very few wars that take place between countries anymore. That's a thing of the past. There are, however, a lot of wars taking place in, inside countries, so conflict has become civil. Um, if you think about that, what it represents, it, it's mainly, I mean, in many ways, it's much, it's much more relevant to the development context, isn't it? If you think about wars taking place within countries, it's not about interstate war, power politics, you know, governments fighting each other. It's, it's about the problems that are intrinsic to a nation whether they're racial and ethnic, whether they're based on resources, or whether they're based on historical grievances. <clears throat> but these are, these are development. They're problems of economic and social development. And then the environment is, uh, is, is a much, much bigger challenge today than it ever was. You probably hear, if you read The Economist or things like that, you probably hear about like conflict resource wars uh, being fought, and that that's going to be the next thing. Well. Probably, I mean, probably it, uh, resources are going to exacerbate a lot of conflicts, like the, the water issue in the Middle East, for instance. I don't know if you follow the Middle East peace process, which is uh, in itself a very special issue in the UN, but you know, in, between Israel and Palestine, there are these aquifers. So it's, a, it's in many cases, the natural resource dimension is very important. Yes? It's a good question. So the UN is a very complicated family um, of institutions. The it has many agencies, programs, special funds set up within it. You've probably heard of things like UNICEF or the World Health Organization, uh, UNDP the food and agriculture, so there's like more than 30 different special programs and agencies of the UN. And they're all over the world, actually. Some, many of them are here in New York. They're like, UNICEF is across the street. Um, some are in Geneva, 
like I said, UN Environmental Program and UN Habitat, the program for human settlements. Those are the two that are headquartered in the Global South in Nairobi. Um, but then you have this interesting animal, we call them IFIs, International Financial Institutions, and those are also known as the Bretton Woods Institutions. The Bretton Woods Conference uh, in the 1940s established the uh, World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, and those uh, are uh, slightly special. I have to, you, you, uh, you actually hit a good point there. They're slightly special because in the whole UN family, um, the Secretary General is the head of, of the UN organization, but then there are the special agencies that sometimes have their own, they follow their own agendas. They might have different obligations to countries because they have slightly different structures. But the, the international financial institutions are truly special. And um, they, in many ways, have um, a vision for development um, that it, it, it reflects, in a sense, the composition of the executive boards of those organizations. The World Bank does not have a universal, it's not a universal membership body, and it also doesn't have a perfectly uniform um, uh, voting system, let's put it that way. The General Assembly, to which I am accountable, has a one state, one vote policy. So we are looking at global politics in that context, how governments negotiate in, in, that, in the, the, that world, which is pretty weird. The World Bank, however, is maybe a little bit more, um, it's like a little bit more uh, attuned to the realities of politics in the world. The richer countries have more votes than the poorer countries. So in fact, they determine the agenda of the organization a little bit differently. So actually, the UN is full of organizations that operate like this. And it can oftentimes make it a very uh, complex and contradictory world. But that is the one thing, if I hope that you walk away from this little discussion with one concept in your mind, it's that the UN is like a paradox. I mean, it has many, many things that contradict itself. For instance, here's a great example. The Secretary General of the UN is supposed to have two roles. He's supposed to be um, a servant of the member states, the executive officer of the organization. And then in other places, other ways, he's also supposed to have a political role. Um, in many ways, it's very useful. The Secretary General is a diplomat. The Secretary General uh, extends what we call his good offices to parties. He mediates between conflict. But he also is an advocate, <coughs> which means that when the Secretary General feels that something uh, is missing, that a voice is missing in the conversation, he can provide his own views. And usually, the Secretary General becomes an advocate on areas of peace and security only, when there's human life at stake, when conflict is about to or has happened already. Um, development is a bit different. We see the Secretary General behaving much more as a facilitator, as a convener of governments to let them make the decisions. And remember how I said that in the context of post-2015, governments are looking at trying to be more in control of the agenda this time. They don't want to see rich countries leave without obligations. They want to see maybe a little more equity and fairness. It's because they want to be in control of the agenda on these types of things, like sustainable development. Um, and so we see the Secretary General behaving differently. This is another paradox of the UN. The UN is full of contradictions and paradoxes, but it's a very dynamic and alive organization. It's constantly changing, and it, it has to respond always to global politics and what the atmosphere is um, between countries. <coughs> yeah. Did you have a question? I, I did. I um, was interested in that initially the perception of many people, I think, that the UN is to up here. Mm. You know, a club of nations and um, less direct relevance to political people. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm thinking that with globalization, um, um, participation of NGOs, uh, there's an opportunity to um, through the engagement and empowerment of civil society mm -hmm. uh, is, is actually um, to empower um, the, the rights of the people, but also um, to give voice to the people within countries that might be uh, suppressed or, or marginalized. Uh, and in fact, I, I think that's the problem more today is that although you know, there isn't the kind of uh, warfare mm -hmm. that was years ago, but there are still many, many problems within countries. And, and somehow I'm wondering how to use the uh, opportunities of the UN you know, through its diplomacy, through its uh, dialogue, and through its incentives to 
somehow build um, you know, more of a, a relevance to the people um, across countries? Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, and I, I think it highlights also a very interesting intellectual paradox about the UN, which is that it is a club of governments, sovereign nations. Some of them speak with a, a voice, the voice of their people better than others. Let's just put it that way. They're not all, they're not all doing such a great job. Of, but somehow in this, in this combination, you have to have the will of citizens at heart. And um, the UN doesn't have a lot of accountability to individual citizens. So I, I don't know. I don't know what you guys think. I, I like to think, though, that the next phase of the life of international politics is going to probably have to take this into account a lot more. It's going to have to find a way to be accountable to citizens and yet also somehow strengthen the, the impact of governments or make them better able to deliver services and development to citizens. Where do we find that? We have to try to get the voice of different stakeholders in the UN. And I think I observe, I mean, I've only worked in the UN for eight years, but in my small time, I have seen, the, I've seen a lot more participation in the UN. Um, I think, yeah, actually, I think it's even empirically verifiable. The number of non-governmental organizations that are registered in consultation with the UN has probably increased by 50% since I've worked here. So this is becoming a much, much more accessible house for private citizens and people who represent groups that are marginalized to have a voice. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know what you guys think. If, if, do you think governments are going to more and more accept this idea, or do you think they become afraid of maybe opening up the doors a little bit more and making it a more multi-stakeholder environment? Would that make decision making easier? Would it make it harder? I don't know, any good questions? Um, it's like a form of peer pressure um, mm. by which, um, by moral persuasion, you know, shaming yeah. uh, and, and open transparent discussion. Yes, yes. You can elevate the accountability of all those global citizens. Yes, it's a good point. It's a, it's a very, I hear that view quite a bit. If I could just share my own anecdote, you know. I, so I've been involved in sustainable development only for the last two years. I used to work in political affairs for a while before that, so I was doing completely different type of work. But um, it, you know, my main goal has been, to, uh, my biggest project was delivering this Rio Plus 20 conference. When you have a summit that is of that magnitude, you know, when we finally closed the doors and took down everything, we counted the number of people, it was the, it was the most heavily attended uh, event ever held in the UN. We had over 50,000 participants at that conference. It was huge. That's because Brazil is also, a, I mean, a very active so civil society, and you have a, it's a huge country. It's the Texas of Latin America. Let's put it that way. But um, so it was a, a huge, huge conference. It takes several years to prepare that kind of conference because you start negotiating very early, so that by the time the heads of state arrive in Rio de Janeiro the agreement is ready to be signed. It's been negotiated for a year, basically. Um, I noticed at that conference something, so you actually asked a very important question that's close to my heart, because my role in all of this is to try to in, in, ex, increase the exposure of governments to NGOs and you know different types of stakeholders and actors. So make sure that indigenous people are at these meetings and that they're getting the best thoughts from think tanks and climate experts, and, but from outside, non-governmental. And um, you know we have to kind of uh, find a right balance. Like you said, there's peer pressure. There's a kind of atmosphere of <coughs> critiquing governments, of you know keeping them accountable. And at the same time, we want to also make it a friendly atmosphere where governments can actually express themselves without fear of uh, you know, of criticism or emba public embarrassment, right? So we, we tread in this very delicate space sometimes. And I noticed that in the course of these negotiations, we started to slowly open the door more and more and more. Um, maybe a few years ago, there were, there's, there's rules about NGOs being this close to, you know, they can make statements and things like that, they can maybe meet delegates and they can advocate, but once negotiating starts, we shut the door. And it is only governments that can negotiate and vote. Well, Rio Plus 20 proved to be something kind of different, actually. We left the doors open. And um, these rooms, 
you have to imagine a conference of 50,000 people. There were like 20 or 30 parallel negotiations taking place all over. I mean, it's, it's almost mind boggling. And every single room is open, and it's packed to the walls with NGOs and governments, and everyone's mixing and mingling. And sometimes I would see NGOs putting text up on the table, and then you would see it come up on the screen, and a government had adopted it and decided to include it, and no other governments objected. And actually, in many ways, the, the negotiation of that outcome of Rio Plus 20 was very much a multilateral effort. There's much, 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 much text there that was not proposed by governments. It was proposed by citizens. Um, and what's very encouraging to me is that the governments reacted very well to this. Um, nobody got nervous, nobody asked to close the doors and to, um, and to kick out the NGOs. There's other processes that are not so successful. I have to be honest with you. Um, climate change, these are very, very tough negotiations. Governments agree on very little. And it, there's, there's, you know, you probably, if you read the news, you probably know that those are tough. They don't really go anywhere and they're actually stalled right now. So. Um, the role of NGOs is very contentious there. In fact, uh, in Copenhagen in two, uh, 2010, I think, or whatever it was, that was something we had in our minds when we were preparing this summit, that um, if, uh, if governments want to shut the door and kick out the NGOs, it's going to look awful. It's going to look awful for them. It's going to look awful for the UN, most of all. The Secretary General will look bad. So you know, we're trying to always try to create this, this friendly atmosphere. And we actually really achieved it this time with sustainable development. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking that maybe if this becomes more normal, if delegates are more sensitized to having NGOs sitting with them and behaving like allies, uh, not antagonists, then we can have a really multi-stakeholder environment. But I might be wrong. But that's what I think. Any other questions? So you've mentioned you worked in the Department of Pol Politics before uh, moved into uh, the Sustainable Development Department. I wonder, like, did you choose to move, or I was just interested in like, uh, like your work experience before, like which department uh, you really like, I guess, or like how did you choose to like uh, work in the Sustainable Development? Oh, well, I've, um, I've been in the UN in New York for eight years, and before that I was in the field. I was in Afghanistan for two years. Mm -hmm. So I've actually been with the UN for ten years now. And um, my role in the field was to uh, was in something we call civil affairs, which means um, often the, the, the government is being supported by the UN in capital to try to build political institutions and to um, buildings, yeah, make sensible decisions and support elections and things like that. And then you have to somehow transmit these messages out to the provinces. And so civil, it's a civil affairs team that is often having a lot of contact with regional governments and that sort of thing. So that was my first exposure to the UN. And then I spent uh, a number of years, well, I was actually, I worked as a tour guide for a while in here in headquarters. Have you taken the tour? Yeah. Or are you going to take the tour? Yeah. You're going to, right? Yes? Yes. Nobody knows? Okay. No, no, actually, we're, um, after that we go to the gift shop, right? Oh, the that's, gift shop is wonderful thing. too, actually. Take a picture over there, do some shopping, and uh, I think that'd be it for the day. It's a really good gift shop, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell you the truth. Actually, if you and us, we take a picture together and do it Yes, lo uh, lovely, it'd be fine. Uh, actually, we should probably wrap up in a minute. Uh, but um, I actually did a couple of very interesting assignments uh, in the period after that. I was part of um, a mediation team. For a very short while, for a couple of years, there was a, a mediation that the United Nations convened between the government of Uganda and the Lord's Resistance Army, which maybe it came back in the news again, like last year, I think. And it, there was a peace process that failed; uh, it fell apart. So I was part of that for a little while. I didn't have anything to do with the <laughs> falling apart. <laughs> I can assure you. How did you get in the UN in the first place? Uh, I was in Afghanistan. This was my first uh, my first opportunity in the mission. But how did you join the UN? Um, I w used to work for an NGO in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and then I joined the mission there, the UN mission in the country. And I've, I've basically worked for the UN But I dealt with a couple of interesting assignments. Last before this, I was in Iraq, and then uh, I c I've been working on the sustainable development issue since the Rio Plus 20 conference became um, a project. And now it's over. So now we're implementing the outcome of Rio Plus 20, which is even more challenging than the conference itself.
-hmm. So it's something to watch. It's very interesting to know the context that this is all in happening with this post-2015 thing happening. <coughs> I think you're, you're going to hear more about it in the next year, and it, it will be a much bigger deal. And of course, governments are all going to have different opinions, and we'll see how, uh, how they behave. So why don't we end there, because I don't want you to be late for anything, and then we can <laughs> sessions where we can have exposure to students and be able to see who's interested in being more involved in this sort of thing. Yeah, I think it was fine to expose sessions. If you email me, I'll give you some information. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, same question here. Yes. I'm a representative from NYU. So. Okay, so we don't have a good student network at NYU yet, but we're trying. And uh, we have one at Columbia and like the new school, and we have something at Case University. So we're trying to get more universities in the New York area involved. Where are the um, Chinese? Students and Scholars Association of so okay, wonderful. very actively involved in a lot of different kind of initiatives. Great. So okay. we're willing to offer volunteers if there's any events. Okay, anything. wonderful. Yeah. I only have one card. Maybe could oh, you be in yeah, charge yeah. of... Um, I will... Or can you um, write it down? Yeah. Your email address? Mm -hmm. You can take a picture of the card. Yeah, that would be great. If okay. you could, if she could be in charge. Oh, I can take a picture. Okay, yeah, I'll just give you a So why don't we, why don't we all head out? Okay. I can take the picture. I'll give you the It's not a, it's not a, an internship, it's actually like a... Um, um, yeah. 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 Yeah.